Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this session of Vertica Unify 2021. Our next breakout session is entitled A Technical Overview of the Vertica Architecture. I'm Paige Roberts, Open Source Relations Manager at Vertica. I'll be your host for this webinar. Now, joining me are Vertica engineers John Hefner and Jason Sloan White. Before we begin, I encourage you to submit questions during the session. Don't wait to the end. Uh, just enter your questions into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of the screen as they occur to you. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, and we'll answer as many questions as possible during that time, and we may answer some on the chat as we go along. Any questions that you, we don't address, we'll do our best to answer offline. Alternatively, visit the virtual developer lounge to ask additional questions and continue the conversation with our engineers and product experts after the session. And yes, before you answer, ask, this virtual session is being recorded and it will be available to view on demand this week. We'll send you a notification as soon as it's ready. Be sure to stick around to the very end of the presentation. Um, that's when we'll show you the code that you can use to participate and gain points in our Analyze to Win competition to win prizes. Now let's get started. Over to you, Jason. Thank you, Paige, for the introduction. Vertica is a powerful tool for getting value from large amounts of data. It stands out in the marketplace because it offers an impressive combination of features including extreme performance on large amounts of data, advanced analytics, integration with an ecosystem of other tools, and it delivers that in a package that allows you to deploy wherever you like, giving you freedom from the underlying infrastructure that you want to use. The purpose of this talk is to go beyond just what Vertica is and tell you a little bit about how Vertica works. There's a lot to say. We've been building and evolving uh, the product for over 15 years. Each component has complexity and challenges uh, that we've overcome uh, and innovations that we've pioneered to, to make the product overall a valuable thing for our customers. In order to organize our thoughts today, we're going to break the system down into components, and then we're going to look at some of the key architectural decisions that we've made and see how those influence the components. So the architectural decisions that we're gonna to cover today are the choice to make Vertica a relational database supporting SQL in the SQL e ecosystem, Vertica's optimized storage system, its massively parallel processing, its flexible deployment strategies, and its extensible analytics. I'm going to start by going through the, the choice to make Vertica a relational database in supporting the SQL ecosystem. Vertica is a relational database, which means that it stores its data in tables. Relational databases have proven themselves to be a useful way of handling data. You can tell that because they have wide adoption. There's a variety of different relational database products out there, and they've been around for quite some time. SQL is the dominant way for interacting with relational databases. A key feature of SQL is that it's a declarative language. That means you specify what you want to do, but not how to do it. That gives us an opportunity to tune and adjust the way we answer a query, but to be able to do it in a highly performant way. We're not the only place that has been tuning their relational database over years. Relational database research is active and ongoing in both academia and industry. The key thing here of SQL is that it's both standardized, because SQL is the dominant way for interacting with relational data, and it's also flexible because of its declarative nature. Relational databases, many relational databases, make the choice to split the responsibilities uh, between two different components of the software, a client and a server component. The database service is responsible for storing the data and executing queries, and the database client component is responsible for providing APIs that allow users to submit queries over the network and then fetch the results. Clients typically run on hardware that is separate from the server hardware. 
And uh, the client APIs have been around for quite some time. So there's strong standards associated with those APIs. Some of those standards include JDBC and ODBC. The client APIs and the client server architecture deliver the same key benefits as, as SQL. And that is they're, they're standardized, but they're also flexible. That, um, so that enables us to tune and enhance the way we answer queries to, to deliver value. So to understand the, the value of meeting the standards, we need to zoom out and look a little bit at the data management process as a whole and Vertica's role in it. The diagram on this slide uh, shows a generalized data management process. So data is produced and loaded into the database, starting from the left, and moving into the database as we move to the right. And then eventually that data is queried, visualized, and interpreted by, by users at a next step in the process. Each of these steps surrounding the database, the loading and the visualization and, and interpretation, each of those steps has requirements and challenges that are unique to those steps and are different in different use cases. Vertica wants to empower people to build tools that solve their specific data loading and visualization and interpretation uh, challenges the way that's best for their requirements. And the way we can support them to, to, and empower them to build the tools that they need is by meeting the standards uh, in the driver APIs and the storage APIs. So that's the key benefit of supporting standardization is that we allow people to build the tools that meet their requirements. This slide is a bit generic uh, when talking about standardization here. The next slide we've moved to makes it a bit more concrete. So for loading data into Vertica, we support integration with services like Kafka and Amazon Kinesis. We support ETL tools like Informatica, and we support a variety of visualization tools, including Tableau and Grafana. So we zoomed out to see the benefit of standardization. And now I wanna zoom in and take a look at the steps in query processing within the database. We already talked about how Vertica has a client uh, server architecture where the client is submitting queries to the server across the network. And that's what we see here on this slide. The next step after the query is received by the session layer and the network message is unpacked is that we pass the query along to the parse and analyze stage. The parse and analyze stage makes sure that the query is syntactically and semantically valid. Syntactically valid means that the query has no mismatch parentheses or quotes in it. And semantically valid means that the query makes sense. For example, the table named stocks in this example exists and the column price also exists. Uh, so that's how we make sure that the query is syntactically and semantically valid. The next stage is that we pass the query off to the optimizer uh, so that the optimizer can construct a set of steps that will satisfy the requirements of the query. We call that set of steps a plan and there are choices that the optimizer makes in constructing that plan. It chooses, for example, the order in which to do the operations and it might also choose to omit some steps that aren't necessary to get to the final answer. So once the optimizer has put together a plan, it hands that plan over to the execution engine and the execution engine runs all the steps in that plan, such as scan all the tuples in the relation and then run the average function on the, the data that's in those tuples. And when the execution engine starts to run and needs to, to actually begin reading the data, it gets that data from the storage layer. Uh, which may read data that is stored locally on uh, that, that is stored locally or is accessed via some other API. You can visualize the data flow in a query execution in a simplified way uh, you, with the diagram that I've shown on this slide here. In this diagram, the tuples are flowing from the storage layer into the execution engine to the session and then out to the client. So we spoke earlier about 
how it's advantageous to be both standardized and flexible. And this slide tries to relate those benefits to the components of the system. The client layer and the SQL processing layer are more standardized, and we have a lot more flexibility when executing a query to, to be flexible in how we do that. So our architectural tour has already covered with the SQL and ecosystem stage. We've covered the, the client layer, the session layer, and a little bit of parsing and analyzing. The next step on our architectural tour is going to talk about the storage layer and how we optimize storage. So let's take a look at how Vertica's optimized storage works. Vertica is optimized for answering analytic queries, and those are queries whose answer requires reading many, many rows, as opposed to just finding a, a single row. An example of an analytic query is the average stock price. So I've got uh, details of that example on the right-hand side of this slide. So uh, you can see in the breakout box here that we have an example table named stocks. It has three columns in it, a symbol column that's a Bar car, a price column, uh, and a ticker time column. And the query that we're going to look at for this table, the analytic query we're going to look at for this table is select the average price from the stocks where the symbol looks like a particular symbol. I've included some example data uh, in the little table below the breakout box. Vertica's goal is to store and access the data as efficiently as possible to answer queries. This is critical to query performance, and it's critical because, generally speaking, we're looking at large amounts of data. That means it doesn't fit in memory or caches, so the performance of reading this data from disk is going to be crucial uh, for the performance of the query overall. So let's take a quick tour with our example uh, and see how the columnar storage works. So Vertica takes the set of rows in the table, sorts them, and then breaks them out into columns. Each column gets stored in a separate file. And then before we write that file to disk, we compress all the data in that file. That's how our columnar storage model works. Let's take our example query where we're looking for the average price in the, st in the stocks table. That query doesn't need to ever read the information in the time column. So we can just never open that file and we'll skip all of that information. An additional benefit of columnar storage is that we're reading compressed data. And the compression of similar values is very, very effective. We, we made sure that every file contains the same kind of data. For example, the first file that's in purple here contains just symbols that are all var cars. And the second file contains just numbers that are all floats. And compressing these values uh, in, in their files is very effective because they're all similar kinds of data. Finally, when we go to read this compressed data, we read it off of disk sequentially, which is more performant for both the solid state drives and uh, conventional spinning disks. So while we were walking through our example, there were two representations of a table that came up. There was the logical representation, the table name and its columns and the data types of those columns, and then the physical representation of that data, which was the, the set of files that stored all the data. Projections are, uh, so Vertica distinguishes between the logical table representation and the physical representation. And projections are the way we offer to manage the physical, the different physical layouts. A single logical table can have many physical representations. Each physical representation can be optimized to give good performance for different kinds of queries. So for example, in the, the diagram I've shown on the right here, there's different projections associated with the same table and they have different columns in those projections and the columns uh, are in different sort orders for those sets of rows. Choosing how to lay out the physical projections uh, can be a tricky process and we have a tool to help with that called the database designer. It can help users guide their choices about projections. 
managing the projections, uh, especially many projections for a single table, it could be a really cumbersome process. Uh, but the system handles all that for our users automatically. And there's really two key parts to that automatic handling. One is that we keep all the projections up to date automatically. So loading data into the table means all the projections get all the rows in that data load. And two is that we choose via the optimizer, the projection that is best for answering a given query. So the user doesn't have to know that they're targeting a specific physical layout of the data. We choose the best one for them automatically. There's more to talk about in the storage layer um, that helps Vertica deliver high performance analytic queries uh, more than I can possibly talk about here. Understanding the other pieces of the storage layer benefits from having a discussion of the other stops on our architectural tour. So now I'm going to turn it over to John and he's going to take you through the rest of the steps in our architectural tour. Thanks, Jason. So again, uh, performance is a big part of the reason for Vertica's existence, uh, in particular performance on large volumes of data. So while optimized storage and the quality of the implementation uh, improve efficiency, at some point you just need more CPU, more memory, and more storage space. Uh, so a design goal for Vertica is to have no limits on data volume. Uh, so unlike some systems, it does not rely on uh, vertically scaling hardware, and instead scales out horizontally. Uh, to store and analyze more data, just add more servers. Uh, to avoid scaling bottlenecks, all Vertica nodes are peers. Uh, every node uh, is able to accept client connections, and connections can be load balanced between nodes. And there's no single point of failure. Um, and perhaps more importantly, no scaling bottleneck imposed by a single special node. Um, how does Vertica accomplish this? Uh, first, I wanna talk about how we manage storage. So in a Vertica cluster, uh, data is distributed across the nodes uh, using what we call segmentation. Uh, segmentation uses attributes of the data itself to determine how it's distributed. Uh, concretely, uh, each projection has a function over its tuples mapping to an integer, and that range is then split up among nodes in segments. Uh, think of a, a pie to be, being divided into slices. This approach has a couple really nice properties. Uh, one is that all the nodes can globally agree on where any given piece of data will reside uh, without any knowing any of the particular details about how it's stored. Uh, for instance, you know, where on disk uh, pieces of data are located. So not only is the data distributed among the nodes, uh, but most metadata is also distributed. Um, which uh, addresses a key scaling issue many distributed systems have. Great, so uh, data is distributed on the nodes, um, but you might be wondering what happens when a node fails? A challenge in all distributed storage systems is fault tolerance. Laws of probability dictate that the more nodes you add to a system, uh, the lower the mean time to failure. To provide durability and availability, what Vertica does is to give every node more than one segment. This ensures that even after losing any one node, all the segments are still online. And in fact, most of the time, the cluster can tolerate many node failures. A cluster can be made aware of nodes likely to experience correlated failure. For instance, uh, one residing in the same rack that share a power supply or a network switch. Vertical will then ensure segments are distributed so that even if all nodes in a fault group fail at the same time, all the segments will still be available. Now, what happens when a node that's been down rejoins the cluster? This is a process we call recovery. By recovering, a node pulls missing metadata and data from its peer nodes. The recovery process is largely non-disruptive to the rest of the cluster. You know, it doesn't involve halting loads or queries. Okay, so that's a bit on how Vertica stores data. Let's talk about how we query the data. 
So distributed query execution begins on any Vertica node. We call the, in the context of a particular query, the initiator. The initiator node does the parsing and optimization and constructs a query plan. Like any SQL database, the plan consists of a graph of operators that take in and emit tuples. Um, you may recognize some of the operators in a, in a Vertica query plan from the relation algebra that provides the theoretical underpinnings of SQL. Data flows through the graph, starting with storage, and finally emitting query results. In Vertica, the operators can be connected not just in memory, but also by network streams. Once a plan is constructed, it's distributed to all of the nodes that are participating in the query. The nodes then customize the plan using their own local metadata and instantiate operators and begin query execution. Vertica versions the data and metadata, allowing a consistent distributed view and transaction isolation. In fact, with a default transaction isolation, queries can run without holding any locks and multiple inserts can also be run concurrently. One important item to note is that the planning process is segmentation aware. It can take advantage of properties of the segmentation function and push as much of the execution as possible down to the local nodes. So for instance, if doing a group by over the same set of attributes used in the segmentation function, aggregates can, can be computed locally and only the aggregate values need to be sent over the network. The segmentation function is often a really important part of the projection design. Now I want to move down a level and talk more concretely about how Vertica stores the data in the segments. Anytime data is loaded, say with an insert or copy statement, Vertica creates one or more storage containers. The tuples loaded get broken into columns and coded, compressed, and written out into persistent storage. Metadata is recorded in the catalog and the transactions committed. These storage containers are the result, and they have a couple really key attributes. One is that they're immutable. Once the data is written out to disk, the contents never change. So you might ask, how do you modify the contents of a table if the storage containers can't be modified? The deletes are represented um, by holding delete markers. You know, these are references back to deleted data so that they can be removed from results at query time. And these delete markers are put into storage containers themselves. An update is simply a delete and an insert. To prevent the uh, accumulation of too many storage containers and deletes, a background process called the tuple mover reorganizes storage, merging together multiple storage containers into new ones while purging deleted rows. It uses, some, it uses some heuristics to balance between the cost of rewriting storage and the benefit of merging the containers. The combination of these properties makes Vertica very flexible in its use of storage. Uh, many distributed file systems and object stores do not allow modification of data once it's written, and they perform really poorly with random access I.O. Vertica's adapted really well to these technologies and now has a modular storage abstraction layer that uses a wide variety of storage systems. So in addition to local disk, uh, we now support HDFS, Amazon S3, Google Cloud Storage, Azure Blob Storage, as well as a number of on-prem object storage systems. So with that in mind, I want to introduce two different storage modes that Vertica offers. The first option is what we call enterprise mode. This uses a shared nothing storage architecture where every node manages its own local storage. As we discussed earlier, Vertica itself manages replicas to ensure durability. So the storage itself can be simple, inexpensive, direct attached disk. This mode makes efficient use of resources, uh, normally with only a single data replica. It scales well too, since the cross-sectional throughput is directly proportional to the number of nodes. The second option is what we call Eon mode. Eon mode uses a shared storage system with local disk as a cache layer. 
uh, this local cache we call depot. The appeal of Eon mode is in flexibility, decoupling the compute from the storage, allowing both to scale uh, elastically independently. This does come with some cost. It does generally require more total storage space um, with the cache plus the shared storage. And most shared storage systems uh, keep more copies of data than Vertica does for a variety of reasons. Uh, however, this cost is often offset by economies of scale in large shared storage systems, especially in the public cloud, and by uh, cost savings realized by adaptively scaling the compute to the according to the demand. Another trade-off is performance. Um, shared storage systems, um, they do promise limitless capacity, but they do have throughput limitations. Um, and can become a bottleneck as the cluster scales out. Uh, the caching layer gives the best of both worlds for query performance. So having talked about the flexibility enabled by how Vertica stores its data, I'd like to talk about another key point, enabling flexible deployment. So Vertica is just software. This might seem obvious, um, but it's not true of all products in this space and it has some important implications. One is that Vertica is self-reliant. Uh, it avoids dependencies on unique features of hardware or external systems. So for example, distributed systems capabilities like high availability, um, repairing a cluster when nodes go down, load balancing, backup and replication, these are all built into the product. Uh, we aren't using middleware or any specialized infrastructure for these features. This enables running anywhere from your laptop to a set of servers in a data center to a private or public cloud. And we're introducing a managed service as well, Vertica Eon Accelerator. So check out that talk later today. And as such, there's no one way uh, that's gonna fit all for deploying a cluster. Vertica comes with its own cluster management suite, uh, but we also want the flexibility to integrate with other systems. We've got tools to help integrating with Kubernetes or deploying a, using cloud formation templates, for instance, um, as well as others. And since we know we can't address everything, uh, we publish an integrator's guide to help anyone adapt Vertica to their own unique deployment needs. And now I wanna to touch on another important aspect of flexibility, which is extensible analytics. SQL is a powerful query language, uh, but sometimes you need more. And it's cheaper to bring the computation to the data than the other way around when you're dealing with really large data volumes. So we've designed an SDK, uh, which sometimes refer to as user-defined extensions or UDX framework, uh, which lets anyone write functions in their language of choice uh, that can be executed right on the Vertica nodes as part of a query. And hey, uh, we use the SDK ourselves. Uh, notably, we ship packages with the Vertica server for doing machine learning, geospatial analytics, text search, and for integrating with other systems like uh, you know, Apache Kafka and Spark. And Vertica also includes support for most popular structured and semi-structured data formats in addition to its own native format. And using its modular storage access layer, I can query these formats right where they are. Um, or import them into the database for best performance. So tying this all together, Vertica is designed from the ground up to deliver excellent performance running advanced analytics on lots of data. It's also designed to be flexible. It's flexible enough to run anywhere and it's flexible enough to adapt to a changing ecosystem. These principles have served us well and we'll continue building on them into the future. So we've covered a lot of ground today, and we've only really just had time to scratch the surface. So to dive deeper, here are some additional resources that go into a lot more detail. And with that, uh, over to you, Paige. Thanks, John. If you want to learn more after this conference is over, remember that our Vertica Academy is always available for free on-demand training and certification. Now we're ready for Q&A. Hi. All right. 
So we had lots of good questions come in. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to jump into them because there's so many. I'm hopefully, hopefully we can get to them all. We've got a fair amount of time. How does Vertica read compressed data? Does it not require decompressing? Who wants to take that? Jason? John? Um, uh, I'll just say, uh, yeah. Um, John, go the, ahead. The easy answer is, is yes, it needs to be decompressed. Um, so, you know, whenever Vertica writes out uh, data, it uses encoding and compression. Um, and whenever it's read, it has to be decompressed and decoded, um, as you'd expect. Uh, but the, uh, the implementations of those are, are fairly well optimized. Um, and uh, when you're streaming lots of values out, the, the overhead's pretty low. But the simple answer is yes. One question I had is uh, when you do like a select or uh, an aggregate or something like that, do you decompress before you do that or do you decompress when you present to the answer? Uh, the decompression is done as, as part of the query execution. Um, so the, the query plan, as we discussed, you know, you build, build up your, your operators, um, and, uh, you know, one of those is the, the one that reads out the storage and, and decompresses it, um, before you, you pass it through the other transformations before producing a final result. Cool. All right. Thank you. Um, let's see, you said every projection has its own customizable segmentation. How should I decide how a projection is segmented? Yeah, I can answer this one. There's a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, generally speaking, you want to have each node have an equal size amount of data on it. So you want to avoid segmenting by uh, a value in the table that is skewed, uh, meaning that it'll have an uneven distribution across nodes. Um, depending on your query workload, that's going to determine a lot of your of the other properties of how you design your projections. In particular, if you have two tables that you'd like to join together very frequently, then you want to try and lay out those tables so that they're segmented in a similar way so that the work to do the join between the tables can be done locally to the node and then shared. And then the result of the join can be is the only thing that needs to be transmitted between the nodes. Uh, similar for, for aggregations, you want some of those to know local. Uh, and finally, uh, another thing to consider when, when thinking about projections is that sometimes for a very small table, uh, it makes sense to have that table available on all the nodes. And so you, if, you, if, if that's the right trade-off for your uh, workload, you can make an unsegmented projection that is fully replicated to all nodes in the cluster. I think that covers the, the different kinds of ways you can design your projection. Oh, and the database designer can finally help you as well. You mentioned that. Always, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, actually, okay, we'll switch to John. Uh, can databases be converted between Eon mode and enterprise mode? Um, so we have a tool for converting from enterprise mode to Eon mode. Um, so in, the, in that direction, yes. Um, it's a, it's a fairly straightforward process. Um, you essentially make a, a, a clone of your enterprise mode database and then can, uh, can revive it into an Eon mode database. Uh, the opposite direction, um, we do not have an official way of doing that, uh, right now, other than, than just sort of, you know, migrating all of the data. Um, you can't just do an in-place conversion. Um, you know, we have we have some uh, some plans on the drawing board um, for um, essentially converging these these modes, um, but uh, that's uh, future to come later. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, oh, actually. Um, Jason, can you explain late stage materialization? Um, so ooh, this is a tough one and I'm not the best person to answer this, 
but uh, I can tell you what I uh, what I understand Antico? about it. So, late stage materialization, as I understand it, is uh, when you have a query that's going to uh, read from many different tables. Uh, sometimes you would choose not to read from one of those tables until you've done some work that you know, uh, for example, if many tables are going to be joined together, you would only read from uh, one of the tables when you've done some of the other work on some of the other tables, and then you can decide to basically um, read the data from that other table later. Uh, so I don't... Why is it, what trade-offs uh, are better? What scenarios is that better for? Um, I don't know the right answer to that. Maybe John can can help me on that one. John, um, that that one might be a good uh, a good one to take to the dev lounge. That's uh, okay. Probably, yeah, yeah, it takes takes more time than we have right here. If there are any it. that um, that are require a little more of exchange of information or a little more detail. Go to the Dev Lounge and talk to these guys afterwards, and they'll be happy to give you some more information. Um, let's see if I can both tackle John a few more. and I will more. be in a, in a Dev Lounge tomorrow. So both John awesome. and I will be in one All tomorrow. Right. When a recovered node is brought back online, what algorithm is used to warm the depot? Does it know the state of the depot prior to failure? Um, yeah, so basically when a, when a node comes back up, um, you know, if you haven't completely lost your, your local file system where the depot lives, um, it, as part of the startup process, it'll just go out and um, gather information about what's currently in the depot. Uh, you know, the depot is basically just a cache, so you, you go and see what's in the cache, and uh, then it goes from there. I think I answered it, but there, there might have been something yeah, about it's warming. It's just essentially it, you know? how how is the depot warmed? Does it like know the state of what the depot was like before? Yeah, it'll, um, it'll basically it go went out down. And the, or... yeah. yeah, it'll. I mean, it's a file system, so yeah, you go out and figure out what's what's there, uh, and you just sort of recreate the uh, the state from before it went down. What went down? Um, and it's least recently used, uh, right? So. Yeah, mod so modulo, you know, pin pinning and all that, pinning policies and everything, but yeah. Right. Okay. So it follows the policies that you've set. Okay. Um, uh, can Vertica tolerate failure of more than one node? Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll take that one too, since, yeah, it was the area. Go for it. So in, in the most typical configuration, um, you know, Vertica guarantees that failure of any one node will be tolerated. Um, Vertica can also be configured to tolerate, um, to, to guarantee toleration of up to two nodes uh, failure by just having additional replicas of the data. Um, you know, that comes with additional cost. Um, as it turns out, um, though, in the, if you do the math, um, and especially if you set up fault groups to handle things like, like rack failures, um, you almost never really need that because you can generally, um, with a fairly high probability tolerate multiple node failure, even with, um, our, you know, K, you know, K equals one, um, you know, a single replica of the data. Um, and that's, that's because, um, of the way Vertica segments the data. Um, there's a, if, if one node goes down, there's only a small number of nodes that become, become critical ones that if they were to fail again, uh, would cause, um, some amount of data to be unavailable and the cluster would have to go down. Um, so if you have a lot of nodes, um, you know, the probability of multiple node failures, you know, two node failures, um, causing the cluster to go down, it's fairly low and it's, uh, it's, uh, something that most people are, are comfortable with. Okay, thank you. All right, there's two questions that are actually kind of related to each other. Um, how does vertical handle writes and deletes? What are the trade-offs since it's optimized for read? And the other one is, if we can't avoid frequent deletes in our ETL process, what would be the most effective way to minimize the adverse effect of delete vectors? So 
is there one of you guys that wants to jump on that one, Jason? Yeah, I can I can answer. Well, I can answer part of this one. There is the first question has okay. a large scope, uh, and so I can't. So the first question was, uh, how do we handle writes and deletes while being optimized for for reads? Is yes. that correct? Yes. And so that's it exactly. Okay. So uh, the the best way to one one way to manage that is to bulk load your data. And uh, so do a large insert, don't do many small inserts. So doing large inserts of data is helpful there. Um, and uh, a way to handle uh, deletes in particular is to use uh, partitioning on your tables. Um, and uh, partitioning is a way of organizing uh, tables that we didn't have time to talk about uh, in the uh, organizing the storage for your tables. We didn't have time to talk about it today, but it lets you um, uh, lay out so, uh, the physical storage. For example, one you would part uh, one way to partition a table that is used frequently is to partition it by time, uh, so that you have, for example, all the data for a single month gets put into the same set of files, and then uh, you can delete that partition by via the drop partition command and that lets you delete large chunks of data in bulk without having to deal with the, the pain that is caused by um, smaller deletes and updates in your in your workflow so um, there's other tools uh, to, to help address the, the those pain points but that's uh, that's one example of, of, of a way to do that to hear more you can come to the dev lounge and we'll, we'll, we can talk more about that that's a cool strategy and uh more if you want to know it. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, how does service node discovery work with Vertica? At any point in time, how does one initiative node know which one is live or dead? Which which nodes are up? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, we take, uh, so we actually use an, an open source library for this um, called Spread. Um, it does, um, so, you know, some of the, the fundamental distributed systems things, um, you know, cluster formation, liveness, uh, detection, it does, it does what, what most, uh, distributed systems do, uh, you know, it sends, um, you know, periodic, uh, you know, health check messages to all the nodes. Um, and if they, the nodes form, a, a quorum and agree on which nodes are in and out of the cluster. Um, you know, if, if too many nodes go down, the cluster goes down. All of the nodes, yeah, form an agreement on on which nodes are in the cluster. Uh, it's fairly fairly standard uh, distributed systems practice. Uh, let's see here. Um, how does vertical Vertica handle uh, distributed transactions? Uh, like, do we use a two phase commit, or what? What do we use? Vertica basically. Um, it versions its catalog, um, so I don't know. It's it does not use the the standard um, two phase commit uh, that you might be familiar with. Um, this this probably involves a little bit more detail than we can go into here. If you if you're really interested in the details, um, that might also be a good topic for delving Death into lunch. in the dev lounge. Yeah. Okay. Um. Can you give a little more information? Oh, well, we already did that one. Um, one of the best sessions I have attended. Thanks, Jason and John. Oh, that's a good one. Um, can Vertica tell what tool is being used to access the data? So I Jason. can answer part of that. Yes, Vertica can tell which client is accessing uh, is running queries, for example. Um, you can see this in your sessions table. You can see a client type field uh, that gets filled in that's set when a client connects. You can also set a session label that's visible in that table. So you can label uh, your session according to, for example, the kind of workload that's happening there. And then a database administrator, when it's looking at the database, can, can see what's, what's going on in the cluster and get a feel for what's uh, what that session is trying to do, even if it doesn't know, you know, the reason for running a specific query associated with that session, you can see that that connection has come from some application. So the answer is yes, the database can tell, 
The database typically doesn't behave differently for the different kinds of things that are connecting to it. Um, it, it the underlying behavior remains the same, but it is customizable uh, both via the driver and uh, at the application level. Excellent, thank you. All right, well, I think we have hit all of the questions. So um, I think we didn't really dive into a lot of detail in some of them. You probably wanna go and find these guys at the dev launch tomorrow to get more details on that. Um, as I wanna thank you guys for the participation. These were all excellent questions. And don't forget to go to the Analyze to Win section on the uh, event navigation panel, and then choose the session, and then enter the code for this session, which is Italian Greyhound. And uh, please note that a replay of today's event and a PDF copy of the slides will be available on demand shortly. Thank you to our audience today. I really appreciate it. And be sure and stay tuned for a word from our gold sponsor, HPE. Let's face it, public cloud wasn't built to handle everything, but that's okay. Because now you can bring a new kind of cloud experience to all your apps and data, no matter where they live. Meet the next generation of cloud services from HPE GreenLake, a simple open platform built for everything from edge to cloud, all delivered as a service. If you need more, add more with a simple point and click. Get everything as a service, built to order, add services with a click, pay as you go, have it managed for you. HPE GreenLake, the cloud that comes to you.